Today's webinar is proudly sponsored by the Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin. With over 1,200 licensed cheesemakers and the only state that requires licensing to be a cheesemaker, they're also the only place outside of Europe that has a master's cheese program. Welcome to Cheese In-Depth. I'm Michael Landis, and today I have Matt Erdley with me, and he's a master cheesemaker, a Wisconsin master cheesemaker with Klondike Cheese Company. And we, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of Klondike, along with some of their really unique uh, directions, uh, especially in sustainability. And then, of course, we're going to taste some cheese. So I'm going to turn it over to Matt, and uh, he's going to introduce himself, plus uh, Klondike Cheese Company. Matt? All right. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Hi, everyone. I appreciate this opportunity to talk to everyone about uh, this facility that I get a chance to work at called Klondike Cheese. So a um, little bit about me. Um, I am part of the fourth generation uh, of Klondike Cheese, um, started by the Buholzer brother, or Buholzer family, and they're still here. Uh, I'm a part of that family. So I've been with uh, Klondike Cheese for about 20 years, uh, learning under Ron, Dave, and uh, Steve. Uh, some of the some of their uh, cheese craftsmanship trade. Um, I am a licensed cheesemaker, and I also hold a master cheesemaker status uh, for brick and Munster cheeses. So that's a little bit about me. Um, but let's start talking about Klondike cheese and a little bit about the history of us. Um, so Klondike cheese is located in in southern Wisconsin, uh, kind of central southern Wisconsin. Uh, close to the Illinois border. And uh, Klondike Cheese Factory has, has been around since the 1800s. It um, used to be called the Staffecker uh, Factory, I think, years ago. And uh, around 1925, there were many co-ops in this area, um, Greene County, Lafayette County, where we reside, that, that had milk and they wanted, to, they wanted to do something with that milk and add value to it. So um, there's also a large population at that time of immigrant cheesemakers um, from various countries in Europe. And so around 1925, um, this group, local group of farmers formed a co-op and hired a, a cheesemaker by the name of uh, Ernest Buholzer. Um, so he started making Swiss for them uh, around that time period. Well, as years went on, um, you know, he had a family and uh, his son, Alvin Buholzer, after he came back in World War II, from World War II, uh, took over cheese making responsibilities um, from his dad. And so he made cheese here in the facility starting around 1946. And you can see a picture there on the screen of, of Alvin and Rosa and, and Ron Buholzer when he was a, a small child. So things have changed certainly in the years uh, of cheese making uh, from that picture till now. So uh, around in the early 70s, um, 1972, Alvin and Rosa and, and their three boys, uh, Ron, Dave, and Steve, decided to purchase the assets of the cheese factory uh, from the co-op and form their own business. Um, and that's, that's uh, where the modern version of Klondike cheese uh, started. Um, you know, kind of a, a side note about a little bit about the history of Klondike is you know, how did it get its name? And, and it said that at the time, um, the original cheese factory burned to the ground and they were building a new one. And uh, we have a lot of limestone in this area and it's extremely tough to work um, to, to blast away all that limestone. And some of the workers commented that well, we might as well be up in the Klondike up in Alaska digging for gold. And so that name just kind of hung around over the years. And, and obviously that's the name of the company today. So um, moving on from that, um, you know, over the years, um, Klondike cheese has made a variety of cheeses um, including Swiss, Wheel Swiss, uh, Cheddar, Monterey Jack, uh, Colby's. Um, and, you know, in the 80s, uh, I'd say the late 70s, actually, um, they added a few more cheeses, uh, Brick and Munster cheeses. And then around 1984, Ron, Dave, and Steve pictured there, um, had some interest from some customers they, they'd done business with about making this cheese called feta. And, um, so they, they worked the craft, they, they um, uh, learned quite a bit um, in the 80s and, and in the 90s and had built up quite a, quite a feta operation. Um, and so we continue to make feta cheese today, albeit with maybe a little more modern techniques than, than what they were using in 1984. So um, 
moving on from that, uh, around 2004, uh, as, as a companion cheese to the brick and Munster we make, uh, we added Havarti um, to the mix. And we've been making that here for what, 16, 17 years now. Um, so continuing on the history of, of additions and growth as the company has been doing um, in 2013, um, we, we really looked into doing and, and built a plant to make Greek yogurt. Um, you know, that was something that it was, uh, at the time was fairly popular, uh, was growing in, and uh, it was all over the place. And, and we got into it, built a whole new facility strictly to make Greek or custom blended high, high protein yogurt. Um, so, and we are still making that today. So, so where we are right now, of course, Ron, Dave, and Steve Buholzers, they've, they've been here their entire lives uh, making cheeses and yogurts. And, and now the fourth generation, which includes uh, Adam Buholzer and Luke Buholzer and Tina Buholzer and Melissa Buholzer and then myself. Uh, at times I feel like I'm the only one here not named Buholzer. Um, uh, we're making what we feel are high quality consistent cheeses to this day, uh, including, uh, including the yogurt products. So um, I guess moving on to, you know, one of the things that we talk about here and, and mentioned at the beginning, um, Master Cheesemakers. And this is a great program that's, that uh, the Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin sponsor, um, you know, and the uh, Center for Dairy Research um, administer, you know, it's, it's to, uh, I guess, raise to the top, the top cheesemakers in the state of Wisconsin and, and to show and highlight their excellence in cheesemaking. And, Klondike Cheese is so fortunate that on staff right now, we have six master cheesemakers and they're all pictured there from Adam and myself, Dave, Ron, Steve, and then Ron Bechtolt. Um, we're all certified in, in all of the cheeses we make here. Um, and we all had to go through a similar process to get certified for the cheeses. So many of you may know what the master's program is about or have some ideas, but, but really I like to think of it as a minimum of a 14 year process to to get that master's certification. You know, when you start out like I did, you have to be an apprentice for a year learning the basics about cheese making and um, you apprentice to a cheese maker and then you can apply for your cheese making license, which I did. Um, but to even qualify for the master's program, you have to be making cheese for a minimum of 10 years. Um, and that gives you time not only to continue to learn and develop and about not only cheese making techniques, but, but sanitation and quality processes and consistent product. You know, you're learning and, and crafting and, and honing your skills as a cheese maker to get to the point where I, I feel good. I feel like I can grow. I feel like I understand, uh, at least on some level, the art of cheese making. So after 10 years, a minimum of 10 years, you can apply to the program. Um, the program itself is quite rigorous. It's about a three-year program. Um, you need to be making the cheese or cheeses you wanna be certified in for a minimum of five years, I understand. Um, and you submit an application and then there's an oral examination where representatives come to your facility and they, they test your knowledge on basic cheese making, quality systems, sanitation, um, to make sure that you do understand the basics on how to make a safe, consistent product. But then over the course of that three years, you're going to attend classes where you can expand your knowledge, where, where you think you understand cheese making, you know how to do it, but now they're going to tell you why it works and why this process helps and what this does uh, during the cheese making process. So it really expands your knowledge, understanding more of why. Um, in addition to those classes, you'll be submitting cheese samples for evaluation at the Center for Dairy Research. They want to evaluate your product, your cheeses, to make sure that they exhibit the characteristics of that product um, and they're at, of the highest quality. You know, that's, that's really what the whole program's about. I mean, they're going to look at microbial levels and, 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 and other such things, but the whole point is to have a consistent, high-quality product that can represent the state of Wisconsin um, as a whole. So while you're taking your classes and after your oral examination, you're submitting samples for them to evaluate. Then at the end of everything, um, there is a, a written examination and it takes, I would say at least 40 hours. Um, it's rather intense. Um, you're doing a lot of research. You're justifying your answers and, uh, 
and justifying where you found them um, to really show that not only have you gained some new knowledge, but you're also taking that knowledge and applying it to the products you're making so that you can take them to whatever next level of quality or standard you're, you're targeting. So it's, it's really important. Um, it, it's a really important example of, of the culmination of the program saying, listen, I'm willing to do the work because this, I understand how important this is for not only my products, but to represent, you know, Wisconsin um, in the cheese industry. So submit your, you submit your application or your uh, final exam. And then um, you go before, they go before a board and evaluate you. And if you meet the criteria, then um, um, they will apply uh, the title of master cheesemaker. So uh, quite involved. I, I attained my cheesemaker, master cheesemaker status in 2018. Um, so, um, you know, and if an opportunity arises again, we'll, we'll take a look and maybe we want to get certified in more cheeses. Right now, just two cheeses for myself, Brick and Munster. Um, but uh, there's all sorts of opportunities in the future. So, yeah, I guess from there, you know, maybe talk a little bit about the plant. And I, I think there was a slide that popped up a second ago about, you know, what makes good cheese, right? And this, this hits the nail on the head for, for us and for, it should be every cheese maker. This area, Green, Lafayette County, um, wonderful, wonderful farmers who take a lot of pride in making consistent high quality milk. If it starts with the milk and if, if the milk is good, you got a place to go and make a fantastic cheese, whether it's at Klondike or any of the other cheese factories around this area. So um, again, these, these farmers and our, our patron farmers, we have around 60 patron farmers that supply us milk, um, take a lot of pride. And uh, it's really a partnership where they're providing a high quality ingredient to make the cheese and we're taking it and, and turning it into something I think that's pretty, pretty good, pretty awesome. And so, um, that partnership is, we've had some of these farms for, for decades. Um, so we're really proud of that relationship with them and the hard work they do uh, to every day, seven days a week, generate some fantastic milk for us to use. Um, as far as the facility, um, you know, we have, um, we do have three plants on site. And, but one of the things we talk about here at Klondike is, you know, we like to call it a circle of sustainability you know, what do we do and, and are we being responsible with this fantastic resource that's here, this, this great milk that our farmers are providing to us? And we, we like to think we're good stewards of that resource. So of course, you know, the farmers do a great job of providing milk and we, we bring that milk in and then we store it in silos and then uh, we pasteurize it, you know, when it's at the, the particular plant that it's going to to make the product, whether it's yogurt or cheese. Um, then we'll make, we'll make good, high quality, consistent cheese and we'll package it. And then, you know, we have this, this thing that's called whey, right? When you make cheese, you have, you, you make cheese and you have whey. And I don't think it's a secret that, that years ago, whey was considered a bit of a byproduct. You know, what do you do with whey? Uh, how do you get rid of it? You know, animal feed or whatnot or dispose of it. But now, not only is there value in that way, and that's something that we take advantage of, but it's also, again, utilizing this really good resource that, that, that the uh, dairy farmers provide to us. So we'll take the whey, we'll make the cheese and we'll separate out the whey and hold that whey, but we'll also extract other components out of it. We will extract cream. We will extract whey proteins and those whey proteins and the cream will be sold to companies that can go into other food ingredients. And then we'll also extract lactose out of this whey and we'll concentrate it and we'll sell it to a company that turns it into animal feed. Well, then now we have this water, right? We've extracted components and we have this water. What do we do with it? Well, we actually clean that water up. We filter it and clean it up and we will use it in the plant as part of a sanitation process, a cleaning process. So again, we're trying to use this good resource to its fullest as much as we can. You know, for, for any water that's left over that, that we can't use, we have our own wastewater treatment plant on site. We don't haul the water away and, and dispose of it in a field. We, we try and treat the water. We clean it up with anaerobic and aerobic lagoons, um, bacterially treat it to clean it up. And then we have around 400 acres around the factory here that we use spray irrigation to grow fields of alfalfa, okay? Which is then harvested and fed to these wonderful dairy cows to kind of complete the circle of sustainability for us, where again, this is a valuable resource. It's a wonderful resource and let's use it to its fullest. And so we've, we've embraced that and we've been doing it this way for years and years. 
So uh, I guess moving on from there, um, you know, Klondike cheese, we've got a few brands uh, under our umbrella. Um, obviously the Odyssey brand, uh, Feta cheese is, is, is a large part of our business, but the Odyssey brand also encompasses uh, Greek yogurt or high, cust high protein custom blended yogurts. Um, and then under the Buchholzer Brothers brand, um, we have semi-soft cheeses, which would be uh, Brick, uh, Munster, uh, Gouda, and Havarti cheeses. Um, so we do have three, three plants on site, and each one specializes in its own, uh, its own product. Um, again, it's kind of outlined there. Um, included in the Greek yogurt, which I did mention before, you know, it's, it's not just yogurt, but it's also sour creams and dips and sauces. Um, you know, we'll get a little bit more into the product breakdown a little bit later, but, um, you know, the, the sour cream and the Greek yogurt we use, we manufacture is used in a lot of different applications for food service or ingredients. And so it's a wonderful product to start, uh, to start a lot of those, uh, a lot of those dishes with. So a couple explanations about the feta plant, you know, years ago, um, the way that they used to make feta in the eighties and the nineties, um, was really difficult. Um, open vats, which is fine. They're, they're very commonly used around. Um, you would make the cheese, you would add your, your light paste and your rennet, and you would firm up your curd and, you know, um, and then you would cut your curd. But feta curd is a little different than your, than your cheddars or your Colby's, um, where it's a very soft curd and it breaks very easily. So it has to be handled gently. So the actual act of physically scooping out the curd out of the open vat and pouring it into forms and another finishing table was, was excruciating. It was very difficult, uh, very time consuming, very hard labor. So around 2000, um, we invested in state-of-the-art uh, feta cheese making equipment, um, which has been upgraded several times in the past 20 years, um, not only to, to make the process uh, less labor intensive for us, this state-of-the-art automation has also allowed us to make a more consistent product. Um, it allows you to control your fats and your moistures um, so that the product that we sell to our customers is the same every time they get that package. And so um, very proud of this. Um, you know, it's, it's not, there are a lot of, there's some companies that do this, but I, I think in the end, this is, this type of automation has really helped us handle the curd, keep it consistent, form a wonderful product and take some of the physicalness uh, out of it, as well as allow us to expand our business and, and grow. Um, the next facility, uh, I think, is it the uh, yogurt plant or is it the Munster Bay? Is this the yogurt plant? So this was built in 2013. Um, again, all the products we make here are pasteurized. We don't make any raw milk cheeses or raw milk yogurts or anything. Um, you know, in the yogurt plant, it is, it is fairly automated, uh, state of the art as of 2013. And we'll bring raw milk into this plant and we'll, we'll, well, actually what we do is we skim the milk. We pull the fat out because remember I talked about we're a custom blend plant and we will, we will make what the customer desires. So we'll take that fat and we'll take uh, other ingredients and combine it back into the skim milk to create the right fat content or protein level um, that our customer wants. So once that's all blended, mixed together, um, for uh, Greek yogurt, you need to pasteurize at extremely high temperatures to help denature proteins so that they want to hold on to moisture and, and give that consistent body that you're looking for in the yogurt. So we'll pasteurize it. They'll go on to ferment tanks where they will build their acid and build that solid mass of yogurt. And once we've reached the right pH point, we'll break it. That means basically cut that curd, break it, and we will pump it to our filling points uh, our final destination, the package, which could be as shown the 5.3 ounce retail cups that we all eat from every day, up to over 2000 pound totes of yogurt that could be used more for an ingredient, ingredient customer. And then the last facility I think we talk about is the, uh, we'll call it semi-soft cheeses, um, which would include for us the Brick, uh, the Munster, uh, Havarti and the Gouda cheeses. And again, this is, you know, years ago, not too long ago, uh, up till about 2018, uh, we were making cheeses in traditional double O vats. Um, you know, we would make the curd and cut it. And, and um, then depending on whether we're making Havarti or the Munster, you may do some pre-draws to draw off whey, or you may do some washed curd where you add water to rinse lactose off the curd, depending on what you're doing and stirring. And once the curd's prepped, we would pump it onto tables where where there were individuals taking and raking curd and filling up individual forms for Munster and Brick. 
and again, very labor intensive. And then each one of those forms, you know, if you, if you think of that was 4,000 pounds of cheese, you know, and each loaf weighs six pounds, you know, you can imagine each one of those forms had to be turned upside down three times during its time on the table, about an hour and a half, which again gets to be very physically intense. And then all the forms would have to be removed and all the cheese would have to be removed by hand and transported to a brine system and put into the brine by hand. Again, very labor intensive. So in 2018, we decided to expand uh, and modernize our, our Munster make process where again, we make cheese and vats typical way, um, this, similar to the way that we always have, but then now we have curd handling equipment where we can put the curd into forms and the forms can be handled by machines and machines can turn it, which again, number one, took a lot of the physical labor out of it. Two, it allowed us to expand our plant, but three, again, allows consistency of the product. We make it the same way. And every time you open that package, it tastes the same, it feels the same and it works the same. So that's very important to us. You know, Klondike Cheese believes quality, quality, quality. That's what we focus on. That's number one for us. You're gonna get the same consistent high quality cheese every time we make it or yogurt every time we make it. And, um, and this equipment in part has helped us to, to achieve that. So, um, you know, we do have a food safety system. We are BRC certified, which is a global sa food safety standard. Um, we've done that for years and we've got an A rating every year. So, um, you know, the, the BRC is say what you do and do it and, uh, and continue to meet these standards uh, for high quality. So we, we do that. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a summary of what the plant does um, and, and, uh, and some of the cheeses and things that we make. I think there's a little bit more information here to talk about uh, what we do specifically. So to talk a little bit about semi-soft cheeses, uh, again, I've mentioned them several times between the brick and the Gouda uh, and smoked Gouda, Havarti and Munster cheeses, um, all you know, loaves um, and small retail sizes. We do a variety of, a variety of things uh, with them. We can, uh, we can cut them into small packs, but primarily we sell loaves to people for conversion um, that they may wanna use in their process. Yep, and that shows you an example. We do slice packs and we can do uh, eight ounce cuts. Um, again, all of the milk that we use is RB RBST free. Um, and this shows you kind of a variety of what we have to offer. Just shows you some examples of what you can use uh, this product for, which I know Michael will get into in terms of pairing and, and how to you know get the most out of these cheeses. But uh, between the Munster and the Gouda and the Dill Havarti, um, you know, they, they all melt well. They're great melting cheeses. And depending on what flavor profile you're looking for, it can definitely uh, add a little zip or a slightly different flavor to just kind of a standard uh, burger or, or some other application. But all of those as well are great table cheeses too. Um, that's something that, uh, that you see frequently around here. So, so um, we do uh, not only retail, but we do food service and industrial accounts uh, to cover kind of our customer bases, I think. So just to kind of highlight some of the awards, you know, we've been making a lot of these cheeses for a long time and and uh, you know, we've been fairly successful um, with all three shown up there between the Havarti, Munster and the Brick. Um, so we've been fortunate enough. Um, I think a lot of the awards have been World, uh, World Cheese Contest, uh, ACS, uh, US Cheese, uh, Wisconsin. Um, you know, again, we work hard to try and have high quality cheeses and, and we've been fortunate enough to, to be, have, like I said, have some success in some of these competitions for these, uh, for these three cheeses. So we do uh, a variety of products. Um, again, it's the same RBST free milk um, that we source from our local farms. Um, and again, you know, kosher, but we've, we've again, the, the contest, you know, the, the judges have spoken. We've been, again, fairly fortunate over the years uh, with, with a good quality product. We've been able to, to place fairly well at, at, the, at all these different contests. Um, and so we're, we're pretty proud of that. You know, there's, there's a lot of versions, uh, retail versions of this uh, between uh, uh, you know, eight ounce cut of, of feta cheese. Um, but, you know, you can get crumbles, of course. Um, the other thing too, is that about feta cheese, which we're not gonna talk about too much about today, but um, you know, if you know about feta cheese, a traditional feta cheese is, is stored in a brine for most of its life. Um, you know, you, you take it out of the brine, take the component that you wanna use and then put it back in the brine and just let it get better with age. We do offer a retail version that's, that's an eight ounce in brine that's available 
uh, for purchase as well. So it's kind of like a mini barrel or a mini bucket, if you will. Um, and then this is more of a food service where we do pails, um, which is, you know, again, simulating that, that barrel experience um, in various sizes, crumble bags, and, and of course, feta loaves uh, are available through food, food service uh, distributors. So Greek yogurt and cultured products here. So um, what a wonderful, what a wonderful, uh, I guess, uh, variety of options we have here. We do the retail and you can see the flavors. Uh, my personal favorite is the peach, um, but a lot of people like the pomegranate, uh, the 5.3 ounce, uh, just, you know, good solid traditional Greek yogurt items. Um, you know, our products we think are, we're pretty proud of them because we, we try and push and get the sugar, you know, lower than other comparable products. We've worked really hard on the fruit preps to attain that, but still provide that fruit flavor that everyone's looking for. Um, and then in terms of other products that we have available, um, I like to think that, um, you know, you go up in sizes, um, you know, 24 ounce, there's some blended yogurts, you know, the, the prior ones are fruit on the bottom, stir them up and enjoy. These are more of a blended uh, fruit flavor. Um, and you know, as far as from 2013 on, you know, we've been fortunate enough again to win several awards um, through all these wonderful uh, contests. Um, and we'll continue to strive to win those awards as a, as a measure of ourselves against everyone else uh, to show that we are still doing a good high quality product and that everybody likes. We, we do dips. Um, everything is a Greek yogurt base or high protein base. So um, we do a, a really nice tzatziki dip, which I think we'll be talking about today. Um, and, and show you what to do with that. But it, it is a Greek yogurt base. It's got some really nice fresh cucumbers and, and garlic and dill flavor in it. Um, so yeah, we'll be expanding on that later, I'm sure. Um, and then there's also some other dips that we offer in variety of flavors uh, from bell pepper to French onion. Again, everything is a Greek yogurt base. So, uh, so it's got all that creaminess and that good flavor to it with, with uh, probably a little bit lower fat. Uh, we do some four ounce for food service uh, for colleges and schools. At the bottom again, it's you know left to right. It's uh, Adam Buholzer and Luke Buholzer and Dave Buholzer, Ron Buholzer, Steve Buholzer, and Ron Bechtolt and myself. Um, you know, this is kind of the collection uh, of people that are working really hard to try and make high quality products every day here at Klondike Cheese. And so, um, you know, we'll continue to strive to do that the fourth generation and beyond, and and, and see where things take us. That was excellent. Thank you. I, I really appreciated that information on uh, the sustainability and, of course, the, the farmers that you work with. It's always important to know, you know, that those are some of the key points about uh, where we are today and what we can do to help uh, sustain our uh, resources and also help out our, uh, our farmers who uh, do the tremendous amount of work every day. So, that's really cool. So, I don't know. Munster is a, a fairly popular cheese, I think. Um, I'm kind of curious to see how you're going to to match some things up today. But if you're not familiar with Munster, you know it. Uh, I just happen to have a a piece here, and we've been making Munster, like I said, since the '80s, and um, it's got that that kind of that uh, that red rind appearance uh, on the outside, which is the characteristic of Munster, and it's. You know, fresh Munster is a little bit firmer, but as it, you know, keeps going throughout its life, it's got a nice mellow flavor. Um, it's definitely a semi-soft, very pleasing um, to the palate. Um, it's a fantastic table cheese. Um, it can be used and sliced. It's got great meltability um, because of the fat content and the pH. Um, so it's, it's a great alternative to some other cheeses on, on a burger, or even it can be used as a replacement for mozzarella. Um, so uh, I know it's, it's, there's some, definitely some options on how to, how to use this great product. So thinking about it, we, you, you have so much butter in here and that little bit of tanginess to it. So what I was thinking was uh, I wanted to sweeten it up a little bit because it works really well with that. And uh, I'm using uh, an Effie's, and this is an almond um, uh, flavored biscuit. And I really like that because it adds a nuttiness to it. And this can really use, you know, it works well with that. And then uh, I have a Bonnie's Jam, uh, blueberries and blackberries that I thought would go really well with it. Oh, that sounds actually really good. I haven't tried that. Mm. So... It has, uh, 
that tanginess and that butter uh, just really kind of works really well with the almonds, the almond flavor, and also with the berries. So it just has a really nice blend of flavors. And I'd pair it up with this uh, Sierra Nevada. This is a wild little thing. And uh, it's a sour. Uh, don't, don't get scared. Uh, it's a light sour. Uh, it's um, uh, a very, uh, it's one, or a, it has a very sweet fruit to it, not as sour as you typically get. Uh, and uh, I thought that that would be a really nice combination with the buttery flavors and the richness that you get here. You know, one of, one of the things with, uh, with these semi-soft cheeses as we go through them, you know, it's, it's uh, we work really hard to, you know, when you have a fresh cheese, I, I, it has a certain flavor profile to it and a lot of what we're talking about. And then even as the semi-soft cheese starts to age a little bit, that flavor profile is going to change and it doesn't go bad. I think it just enhances it and makes it, uh, makes it come out. That buttery flavor is really going to start bursting out. Um, you know, the slight sweetness might go away a little bit, but then um, it's, you're just going to get a little bit more advanced flavors. But one of the things I wanted to highlight is we work really hard in how we make this cheese to try and keep the body of the semi-soft cheese um, and make it last a little bit longer. So it's still easy to work with, whether you're slicing it or, or making little pieces for a cheese tray. So as this, as this ages, I think one of the great characteristics is it's going to hold its body a little bit longer than maybe some of the other, uh, some of the other monsters that are out there. So I just wanted to highlight that fact. The next cheese that we have is, is uh, your Gouda. Sure. Or Gouda. Gouda. Or if you're uh, good at pronunciation, which I'm not uh, from, from across the ocean, I think they say, is it a, is a howda? That's how they would say it from over there. It's got, um, you know, again, it's got that buttery flavor to it um, and some of the distinctive color, um, you know, that, that marks it as a, as a Gouda. Um, there, again, should be a slight sweetness, uh, mild and soft, um, you know, kind of a, a creamy texture to it. Um, as you enjoy it. Uh, like the butteriness, it has just a little hint of uh, uh, sweetness, like a, a little, maybe a hint of maple, caramel, something like that. Sure. And that's, that's all in the, uh, that's all in the culture selection. You know, we, we're trying to, to find something that's, that's pleasing. Um, there's, there's a variety of cultures out there to create whatever flavor profile you want. And I know that we've worked pretty hard to try and end up on this. That's, again, just has a nice balance. That's really what you want when you're making the cheese is, again, between the, the slight sweet and the buttery, um, uh, a nice balance, but then also a nice balance that stays and stays um, as the cheese, again, matures slightly. So, yeah. Yeah, it has really nice buttery flavor and uh, nice richness. So what I thought with this, because it has a little bit of that sweetness to it, uh, was to go with a pear and uh, uh, Girl Meets Dirt uh, out of uh, Pacific Northwest uh, does a heritage pear with uh, pink peppercorns. Uh, even it's not it's not spicy. Uh, it's just adds a little bit of uh, kind of like richness to it. So this is a heritage, and then uh, I put it on an Effie's pecan. So uh, it kind of has like a uh, uh, a pear. Uh, almost like a pear pie because the uh, Effie's actually gives it uh, kind of like a crust, like a cheesecake crust. Okay. Mm. I think that's a, that's a great, it sounds like a great combination. Again, they should, excuse me, complement each other very well. Um, again, with that, that buttery flavor and that creaminess going with that pear, I, I think that that sounds like an excellent pairing. Yeah, that's, Really delicious. Um, the, the Gouda is strong enough to stay with it. It's not overpowered by the uh, spread. It's not overpowered by the cracker, the biscuit. Uh, it work, kind of works in. It's, it's really nice because, you know, when you are doing a pairing, you don't want to lose the cheese. I mean, the whole point of this is the cheese. And it's, it's beautiful on its own, but... You know, if you're going to add something in, this is a really nice combination. Um, as for uh, uh, pairing, 
Uh, I'd probably go with a with this. This is a, a Gaelic ale, and uh, it's kind of like a, a malty uh, pale. So it's got a nice maltiness to it, and uh, it really kind of picks that up. And uh, I guess kind of like adding a little molasses uh, to the to the mix, and it gives it a little bit more richness. So it'd be a nice uh, both uh, dessert and also like something right after lunch would be perfect. You know, you want something a little sweet, but you don't want something that's going to be overly uh, rich and, and taking away from, uh, you know, the your light lunch if you were doing that. So our next cheese would be the, uh, the dill. You know, it's to talk about, you know, dill Havarti, um, at least in our packaging here, this is a, this is, this is a great product. I think we do a, a really good job. We've been fortunate to win some awards with it. And it all starts with a Havarti base. So, you know, a Havarti cheese, um, obviously pasteurized milk, but then you're also adding cream to it because, again, you want to try and enhance uh, that creaminess and that flavor and that, that, that it gives that starter culture something to work on um, and produce that, that flavor profile you're looking for in it. But then you add... Uh, some dill oil and some dill weed to it. And, uh, you know, it's, it can be tricky at times. Um, you know, whenever we grade dill, it, it's always funny. There's, you know, we, we grade it from time to time and there's a group of us standing around and we get to the dill and we have to try some dill. And then we have to try another piece because dill has its own powerful flavor. And so you have to get past that first, you know, that first dill wave. And then once you get to the next piece, now you can start to appreciate the cheese flavor and the dill with the oil and everything. So it's it's always kind of an interesting one when we grade it. Well, uh, I think in, in the the most difficult part about uh, you know blending this is getting a nice balance between the dill and the Havarti. And dill, like you said, it's it's a really strong weed. I mean, it really brings out a lot of flavor. So it would be very easy to have this taste just dill without the cheese, but you can really taste the Havarti in here and it's got a nice butter. There's a nice tang. The tang though, you know, when you, when you, a lot of times when you're talking about Havarti, there is a uh, uh, kind of like a sour cream tang. This sure. one's, a, this one's a, little, a little stronger, you know? Okay. And I think it's because of the dill, but you mm -hmm. need that to be able to uh, stand up to that dill. And that's that's really great balance. Thank you. Yeah, it's like I said, this is a, it's a wonderful product, but it, it's, uh, <laughs> at times it's a challenge to make, uh, to get, again, you want cheese with some dill, not dill with a little bit of cheese in it. So. Yeah, I, I can understand. And you, you, you definitely have the good balance, a really good balance. And so, uh, you know, dill is, is sometimes hard to pair up with things, you know, I mean, in recipes, it's great because, you know, you could put this on the side. I mean, there's so many things that you could add to dill. I mean, chicken and dill and uh, salmon and fish and a lot of other things. So uh, I went with a 34 degree rosemary crisp and it is just rosemary and dill together with the buttery and the cheese and a little bit of tanginess. You know, you don't really need, you don't need anything else. This is just a nice uh, balance of flavors. Yeah, it's, it, it does, like you mentioned earlier, it stands on its own. Um, you know, if you're looking for uh, just something nice to eat with, with some good flavor to it. Um, again, we're, we're pretty proud of it. Um, you know, uh, I think it's a good product. Again, once you get over the initial dill hurdle, um, and, and you go down that path. So I would, uh, because you have so much flavor and all that, you need something that can kind of cut into it. I would go with the, uh, Sierra Nevada pale ale. Um, you know, it is the standard for pale ales and it would give you a lot of, uh, ability to be able to have that, uh, cleansiness, but also, uh, you know, with the hoppiness and rosemary and dill and hops blend beautifully together. So I would, uh, I, I'd probably go that direction. I have to ask, what would you pair or talk about the tzatziki? Because it is formidable. 
<laughs> it's, well, I, maybe robust. Maybe that's a good way to say it, I think. Uh, but, uh, you know, this, this uh, tzatziki dip, again, with this yogurt base, we've got, um, just to describe it for everyone, if you, if you haven't used it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a yogurt base, and we throw in fresh cucumbers. Um, it's a nice, thick texture, a good creamy texture. You've got that tanginess of the, of the Greek yogurt in there mixed in with the fresh cucumbers and the garlic in the dill, um, you know, it, it's obviously a vegetable dip. It's a chip dip, um, but it's, you know, it does have a ton of flavor. So, um, you know, use sparingly where needed, but it's gonna give you what you're looking for in that flavor. You know, everything is there. I mean, you know, when you talk about the cucumbers being there, it is real cucumber. I mean, it is clean. It was, it's, it's as if I'm, I have a cucumber and I'm biting into the cucumber with it on it. There isn't a like, a, oh yeah, it's similar to cucumber. It is like chunky cucumber. You can just taste that. And it's very refreshing. I mean, you know, it just, uh, you know, in this with, a, a, you know, some fresh vegetables and all that it would be just fabulous. I thought I'm under the uh, impression that this is healthier. I mean, not let like cheese is and I'm just, I'm just saying that. You know, somebody that's going to go with this, they're thinking that I want something light. I don't want something really heavy. So uh, I went with the uh, 34 degree gluten-free, um, you know, a little bit lighter and, uh, you know, right in, stay right in that safe zone. And that's all you need. You know, it, uh, you don't want their cracker or anything to get in the middle of this. It's just so nice just to have that, that balance of flavor. Uh, you know, I have to say that uh, I don't have a lot of experience with it, but, uh, you know, you sent me uh, uh, three. And so uh, I opened up last week one of them, and I was just kind of adding it in. And we have basically found uses for it throughout mm -hmm. almost all of our, I mean, it, it, uh, cauliflower rice, it, it's the savior. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Sure. And, and so it's, it's a perfect addition to that because it's supposed to be light, it's supposed to be fresh and, and adding that in. And so uh, I have to say that it's, it's just such a nice change and a, a nice uh, freshness. I don't really think uh, that I would, I would pair it up with a, a beverage other than just, you know, just what you happen to be drinking at the time is just what you're drinking at the time. I, I would agree with that. It's, uh, you know, I, I was thinking of uh, as a, instead of using, it's simple, but a hamburger, instead of putting your mayonnaise on there, spread some of this on there. That's going to give you a nice, good pairing with, with not, not a pairing, but I mean, a nice flavor profile across that hamburger and just kind of change it up for you a little bit. So I think that would be great. Baked potato sounds good. I mean, it's nice and simple stuff, you know, just to complement with some good flavor. It is. It is with tomatoes and all that that just mm. blends so well, uh, you know, and uh, 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 we had, uh, what was it, lamb meatballs. Uh, I think oh, there's excellent. a name for that, but uh, uh, that's basically the way it was. And then, you know, this is the, the go-to, you know, as part of that. It just really, because that lamb is just so rich that you really need something that can cut into it. And I have to say that, you know, there's a uh, a lot of refreshment of this. It's it's refreshing to add in. It's not uh, it's not overpowering. It actually brings a clean flavor and uh, you know that freshness of the cucumbers. That's just so nice. So summery, getting ready for you know summer and uh, summer meals. That's, that's the best thing. Sure. No, that's that's great. That that um, I know they worked really hard to find the right cucumbers, but that that crunch is really something that you try and you're like crunch. You're right. There's a cucumber in there. It's a real cucumber. So, um, but yeah, no, this is, this is great. This is wonderful. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's, that's, you know, what you were saying is that it's, it's not a, um, like a, a squishy, it's a crunch. It's, mm -hmm. it's definitely crunchy. It's definitely there. You can really taste that and it makes a big difference in the flavor. Uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I'm, I live in Tampa and so we have uh, Tarpon Springs which is all, it's a huge Greek community and there's, you know, a plethora of Greek restaurants. So this, uh, you know, what they serve 
honestly, even though that I know that they're Greek, uh, you know, the quality here is so much more fresher. I don't know whatever they're, they're not putting in the cucumbers in that, not making it as, as fresh as this. So, sure. Well, I appreciate the compliment. That's, that's really nice. So yeah, it's, I think it'd be great on a traditional Euro, right? Go get your Euro and make it at home and spread it on there. So yeah, very nice. Yeah. All right. So that takes us through the tasting. That was really nice. Do you have anything else you want to add before we wrap it up here? No, other than, um, no, I appreciate it. This was, this was great for us. Give me a chance to kind of talk about our family here and our, our business and the chance to meet you and, and, and see what, uh, what people can do with, with the products we make and, and how to enjoy them a little bit better. So appreciate the opportunity to talk to everyone and uh, kind of uh, this has been a great experience for me. Good. Well, Matt, it was a pleasure meeting you and uh, spending the time here. Love your products and, uh, you know, really enjoy the quality. And, uh, uh, and thank you so much for sending them out. And we're going to definitely be enjoying them this evening. So thank you. You're welcome. Welcome. All right. Well, this uh, program will be on my YouTube channel. Uh, it'll, uh, and, of course, you can uh, get the cheeses for yourself and uh, taste along with us if you want to. Uh, it'll be listed out probably in the next couple of days. So again, thank you, Matt, for uh, stepping in. And I really appreciate it. And uh, I'm sure we'll talk soon. All right, take care. All right, you too. Bye-bye.